One of the characteristics of the Center for Rural Affairs is our commitment to intellectual rigor. When we take positions, we do our homework. Another characteristic is our commitment to democracy. We believe that citizens, all of you, should engage in rigorous discussions about issues that matter. These are commitments that we take seriously, not just when it's easy, not just when it's politically advantageous. And that's why we're here today. That's why we invited Dr. Thompson and all of you. Because together, we'll have a conversation about some of the challenging issues we face in today's food and agricultural sectors. If we agree on everything today, I'll consider our time here a failure. Success will be marked not by the extent we agree with one another, but by the extent to which you come to this conversation with an open mind, and the extent to which this conversation makes you think hard. And I can tell you that Dr. Thompson will challenge you to think. I know, because I have first-hand experience. Before I came to Nebraska, I spent two years at Michigan State University, where, Paul can attest, I was a frequent visitor to his office. Trained as a philosopher, Dr. Thompson is one of the few agricultural ethicists in the nation. He's also an engaging writer, and when not teaching in East Lansing, he's often traveling to speak to crowds around the world. His newest book, The Agrarian Vision, is an enlightening and interesting read that I know you all would enjoy. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Paul Thompson. Thank you, Brian. I do try to travel around, and especially living in Michigan at this time of the year, I always try to book a trip, you know, sometime about now to someplace warm, you know, and uh, you know, I looked at my schedule and thought that said Bahama, right? It turned out it was Omaha. <laughs> um, but uh, I, am, I am very happy to be here, and uh, uh, it's true that uh, Brian spent uh, quite a bit of time uh, in my office, and uh, I actually missed some of those conversations. So come, come back sometime, Brian. We'd love to do it again. What I'm, what I'm going to do today is to, uh, I will talk about some conflicts over resource use, water and soil, land, um, and, uh, and, and lead up to some farm policy conflicts. Uh, but I'm really going to frame this discussion in terms of uh, uh, competing philosophies of agriculture. Uh, so I'm going to start out my talk uh, by saying a little bit about what I mean by philosophies of agriculture. This is actually not something that you're going to find in the curriculum of very many philosophy departments uh, uh, in the United States or indeed anywhere in the world. It's probably been, I'm not sure any philosopher ever thought that they needed to have a philosophy of agriculture, although uh, I suspect that uh, philosophers in the past uh, thought more about this uh, than they do today. Um, I know you're sitting there and, and you're probably also wondering, you know, you, many of you probably have never been to uh, a talk by somebody who was introduced as a professor of ethics, and so to kind of set your expectations, just imagine somebody who grew up, grew up going to church on Sunday and listening to those sermons from the pulpit and thinking how fine it would be to stand up there and tell everybody how they were supposed to live their lives but then just couldn't bear the burden of trying to be a moral example themselves. Um, that's what gets you into to ethics. Um, so to, to kind of start out a little bit, I'll just say a little bit about what I mean by philosophy of agriculture and why I actually think this is uh, an important thing really for everybody uh, to be thinking about. Um, sometimes it's hard for me to convince uh, my colleagues in other fields. Uh, I don't mean anything particularly fancy by this idea of a philosophy of agriculture. It's a, a philosophy of agriculture is just whatever ideas, beliefs, assumptions, working hypotheses that are going to shape anyone's understanding of what agriculture is 
and it also shapes their expectations of what the food system does for them. It's kind of how they think about this, what they, you know, what kind of in the background uh, they bring to thinking about uh, agriculture and uh, I'll often use the phrase food system because I do want to include uh, the whole system from uh, some of the companies that uh, produce inputs for farmers uh, down through the uh, processors and uh, uh, the, the uh, um, uh, wholesalers and retailers uh, and uh, in the case of uh, uh, people who are preparing food at home, uh, preparation of food at home. Uh, so this is just kind of how we think about this, and uh, I think this will start to become clearer as I give some examples. What I try to do as a philosopher, I mean, we all in some sense have a philosophy of agriculture, whether you uh, recognize that you do or not, because at some level you, uh, you're engaged with the food system, and I presume most of us ate something today or at least this week, uh, and so you had some expectations about, you know, how to do that. And I know there are some folks in the R audience that are uh, much more engaged with food systems uh, uh, professionally. And uh, so you have a sense of uh, how your farming operation or your farm supply business, uh, you know, what it's doing and how it sort of fits. And that's kind of what I mean by philosophy of agriculture. But what I try to do in my work is to come up with... Uh, concise statements that really summarize views so they can kind of get it out there and talk about it. Um, uh, I expect that these uh, views that I'm going to characterize today are influential. They do influence people's behavior. They not only influence behavior in terms of how we interact with our food system, you know, where we go to get food, uh, what we do when we're um, growing food, uh, but also um, in terms of the way that uh, we carry out our policy dialogue. Uh, and I also expect that these are widely shared. Um, <clears throat> but uh, this, I'm not a social scientist. I don't go out there and do surveys, um, and uh, I don't uh, uh, interview people. I read a lot of that work. But what I'm trying to do is a little bit more creative. It's, 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 it's not really, I'm not really going to claim uh, that uh, this is kind of what people think. I'm offering this as a, a way uh, for us to think uh, here together today. And that sort of leads me much more into the, the why I think doing philosophy of agriculture uh, is uh, important uh, to do. I think of it as a, as a practical tool uh, that helps us think critically um, about how ideas shape the world in which we live and act. Um, and by ideas here, I mean our own ideas. So uh, having a kind of explicit philosophy of agriculture, taking a few minutes and asking yourself, well, gee, you know, what do I think agriculture is? What, you know, what do I expect of a, an agriculture, an agricultural system? Um, but also uh, getting a sense of what might be shaping other people's thinking as well. Uh, so some, I think, I think some of what I'm going to say uh, might resonate with uh, some of you and not with others. Um, I think for many of you, you're going to feel a little bit of the tension between uh, two broad philosophies of agriculture that I'm going to talk about. Uh, but my intent here is not to report a bunch of uh, uh, work that I've done talking to the public. It's to really sort of uh, tease you into thinking a little bit about your own ideas and perhaps also understanding why other people uh, act the way they do or think uh, the way they do. So um, my summary statement of two philosophies of agriculture uh, is uh, I think for many people uh, today, um, agriculture is just another sector of our economy. We've got a healthcare sector. We've got a manufacturing sector. We've got an energy sector. Um, we've got an entertainment sector. You know, you can start listing all the various uh, sectors of our economy. You've got a, you know, fantastically growing technology sector. Uh, you know, people who build uh, uh, computers and iPhones and so on and so forth. And you've got people who think of themselves as working in these sectors of the economy. And you've got companies that think of themselves as operating in these sectors of the economy. Uh, and to some extent, each sector of the economy has its own problems. Uh, but uh, we really sort of think of our economy as, as kind of... Uh, divided up into these uh, uh, sectors, and we have what I really want to focus on is this idea there are some fairly broad spe uh, expectations uh, that we have 
uh, for any, sec any firm that's operating in any sector of our economy. Uh, and I want to contrast this with a different view of agriculture, uh, which sees it as special, uh, sees it as having a particular kind of role to play, uh, and as profoundly different uh, than other sectors of the economy, as, and, and particularly, uh, as Brian was saying, uh, with respect to the ways that we think about uh, the organization of our society and our understanding of democracy, our understanding of citizenship. Uh, I'm going to be talking historically, I'm going to be talking as much as a historian today as a philosopher, because I'm going to suggest that this, not that long ago, was actually the dominant view. Um, certainly if you go back to the 19th century, uh, uh, virtually everybody thought agriculture was quite <coughs> unlike uh, they had a healthcare sector then, they had a manufacturing sector then, they had uh, stores, retailers, they had a retail sector. But they thought of agriculture as very distinctive in comparison with these other sectors of the economy. Uh, but I think that increasingly today, uh, particularly people maybe who are, have no professional involvement with agriculture, you know, yeah, there's agriculture out there, there's farms and there's, you know, companies that are making uh, tractors and chemicals, and there's companies that are buying grain and shipping it around. You know, that's, that's the agricultural sector of our economy. And, uh, uh, you know, they don't think of it as having any kind of special significance. I'll say quite a bit more about this. So this is the basic contrast uh, that I really want to try to uh, draw out. And then I'll end up my presentation by you know, making some suggestive uh, 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 ways of thinking about how operating from one of these philosophies might tend to make you think about uh, some classic policy or, uh, or, or cultural, sometimes there's no clear policy here, uh, transitions in a different kind of way and then hopefully uh, I can really rely on our panelists to either tell me I'm totally crazy or, uh, or perhaps build on this and offer some other examples. So let me, let me talk from this uh, uh, perspective here a little bit and try to give you a little bit more sense of what I, I mean from this. Um, and, and simply it's just that, you know, there are some big rules, broad rules that we expect all firms in our economy to play by. And, uh, um, uh, and the, in this, this view is just that, yeah, well, agriculture is just like uh, the motion picture, picture industry or uh, the energy or energy companies. Uh, we expect them to play by certain rules. And I'm going to be very broad and simple here in terms of talking about some of, some of these rules. One rule is that we expect those firms to be efficient and competitive. Uh, we expect them to uh, be competing with one another, and because they're competing with one another, uh, this is going to drive them to become more efficient in terms of whatever it is they're producing, whether it's food or gasoline or motion pictures, or uh, you know, telephones, or cell, actually I forget, there are no more telephones, right? Cell phones, or iPads, or whatever it is. And then the second rule um, is that, uh, yeah, they're supposed to be efficient and competitive, but they're not supposed to hurt people while they're doing it, right? They're not supposed to impose harm or impose costs on third parties. And by third parties, I just mean you know, people who are not involved in, in the industry, right? So, you know, if you're uh, in the energy business, um, you know, you're supposed to be competitive, but you're not supposed to, um, you know, cause uh, uh, diseases or damage to people, right? Um, if you're in the healthcare business, obviously you're supposed to be uh, producing healthcare, uh, and you're not supposed to be, um, you know, uh, causing harm to people uh, in the way that you do it. Uh, and uh, Broadly, I think this is the way we kind of uh, sketch out the way that we think about the rules for our industrial economy. Uh, now, it's very clear that I've sketched this so broadly that we have very contentious debates politically about how we're going to specify these two rules in detail. And we have very strong disagreements about how much the government should be involved in uh, um, you know, preventing uh, costs or harms, um, how much, uh, you know, how much trade-off we should expect between uh, efficiency and competitiveness and perhaps some accidental harms. I mean, accidents do happen, right? Nobody's perfect. Um, and so we have a, a very robust political debate, you know, and we could have 
obviously a very long philo philosophical uh, uh, question, uh, uh, discussion about how we could spell out our philosophy of the industrial economy. Um, I don't want to do that because I think you can go home and turn on the news and get a pretty good picture of what some of the contrasting philosophies are for how we think our society should be running. I mean, uh, if you can't get it on one news channel, just flip back and forth to two or three different news channels and you'll see that, you know, some people are reporting and understanding events uh, with one set of philosophical presumptions about how we understand efficiency and not hurting people and other people are understanding uh, this in a very different way. What I'm coming to you today is I'm actually lumping all of that into uh, this, uh, uh, this bag because what I want to make a con I want to make a different sort of contrast and I want to talk about how agriculture uh, was once not thought of uh, in this big uh, kind of picture, right? So this idea that, uh, uh, you know, although, you know, we're going to, you know, some, we, we, we see different roles for government, we see different roles for taxes, you know, we still have this big space for agreement, focuses on efficiency being a good thing in one sense, but needing to be constrained uh, by uh, uh, rules that uh, prevent harm to others. And that's kind of a big space for agreement, but it's also the framework that actually defines uh, how we're going to disagree. And, uh, you know, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about uh, uh, pipelines or whether we're talking about, uh, uh, you know, uh, shooting movies and possibly hurting animals when we're shooting movies, or we're talking about, uh, uh, you know, health care and health care gets delivered uh, unevenly in different parts of the country, or should the government be involved with health care? It seems like I kind of remember that being an issue. Um, Sometimes in the recent past, right? I mean, you know, that's the space in which we, we, we disagree about those things, but we're operating within a general philosophical framework. And what I'm suggesting here is that for many people, um, that's how we think about agriculture, too. I mean, we're basically going to take that same set of philosophical presumptions uh, and then apply it to the food system. Uh, and so we're going to get debates about agriculture. Uh, about you know whether um, you know the farm bill is promoting efficiency in farming, and we're going to get debates about whether or not uh, uh, you know we should regulate this and that. But that debate, those debates, are taking place in the same philosophical space as debates that we would have with respect to any other sector of the economy, right? So I'm not going to take sides on the uh, the kind of classic philosophical debates, because what I want to suggest to you is that we can think much more critically if we recognize that in some sense, by thinking that agriculture is just another sector of economy, we've put all of our agricultural issues into a particular kind of philosophical box, and that box has some consequences, uh, and that's what I want us to think a little bit about uh, more critically. Um, I'm going to call this an industrial philosophy of agriculture, and I do that a little mischievously, right? Because I don't necessarily mean industrial agriculture in terms of the way that it's sometimes thought of. Uh, I think a lot of people who participate in very small scale, you know, alternative, organic, whatever you want to call it, are still thinking in this way and, and they're regarded in this way. Um, you know, they're regarded as, well, you know, they've got to be competitive with one another, they've got to deliver things to their customers, and, you know, they sure can't hurt people doing it, right? You know, you start trying to uh, produce chickens, and I don't know if this is an issue in Omaha. It's certainly an issue in Lansing, where I live, right? You know, people don't want to be waked up in the middle of the, in the, middle of the morning by some rooster, right? So, you know, these become sort of the way these things get played out, right? It doesn't matter whether we're talking about classic industrial farm. I'm calling this an industrial philosophy of agriculture because, as I've said, we're thinking about agriculture as a sector of our industrial economy. So, how do I want to contrast this, right? What I want to now present is some way of understanding agriculture so that it's not just another sector of our industrial economy. It's not just up there with manufacturing and energy and health care uh, as one sector among many. How else would we think about this? Uh, and I think we actually have uh, a lot of uh, opportunities for thinking about this. And broadly speaking, 
These are views that understand farming and food consumption as uh, playing unique cultural and or political roles. Uh, it's uh, uh, your understanding um, the food system as uh, uh, producing uh, particularly uh, important uh, products, things that might uh, not in, indeed they feed people, but perhaps they uh, create a sense of uh, identity, right? or they, they create a sense of, uh, of uh, who you are and, and uh, where you are. Um, I spent uh, a lovely summer once in France uh, where I uh, heard a fromagier, right? That was his business. He, he basically doesn't make cheese. Um, he, he ages cheese. I mean, he does sell cheese. But his particular skill is knowing the exact right moment uh, to actually sell the cheese, and the exact right moment to uh, the exact right conditions to keep these different varieties of cheese in, right? And uh, so, you know, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, French students that were in the audience when this fromagier came out and took us through an evening of tasting, you know, 20 different kinds of cheese, uh, were joking with him about. Uh, uh, you know, he was. You know, he claimed to be able to tell what month of the year uh, the uh, milk had been produced because of the way the grass gives a distinctive flavor to the cheese. And they were asking him if he could tell which side of the hill uh, the cows had been grazing on. Uh, and I'm not sure. I mean, sooner or later you're going to get to some sort of a, a limit on it. But we actually have a very robust tradition of this uh, here in the United States, and. Uh, I'm going to uh, start with this quote from uh, Thomas Jefferson, which uh, comes from a letter that he wrote to uh, John Jay in uh, 1786. Uh, John Jay was uh, uh, the first uh, uh, justice of the Supreme Court, and uh, of course Jefferson and Jay are both two founding fathers. This letter uh, is uh, taking place uh, during uh, the early years of, actually it's not the, the, the current republic, it's uh, uh, you know, when, when uh, uh, the war is sort of winding down. Uh, and uh, uh, the subset, subject of the letter is uh, actually about uh, whether or not we should be having a navy or not. And uh, I won't get into that, but this is one of the most famous uh, Jefferson quotations, and I'm sure some of you have heard it before. Cultivators of the earth are the most valuable citizens. They are the most vigorous, the most independent, the most virtuous, and they are tied to their country and wedded to its liberty and interests by the most lasting bonds. And uh, this is actually not um, uh, just uh, idle praise of farmers. Um, you know, sometimes people read this quote or they mention Jefferson and that he thought that farmers were just fine people who never did anything wrong, right? Uh, Jefferson was a farmer. He had a farm. Uh, he actually wrote quite a bit um, about uh, management of his farm, uh, and I've read some of those uh, notes and letters, uh, and he was very capable of talking about uh, farmers as utterly immoral, scurrilous uh, people who could not be trusted, particularly when they were challenging his fence rows. Okay? Um, so he was not naive about farmers as being sort of broadly more moral people, right? Um, it's important that he was talking about them as citizens, uh, and uh, he had something very specific in mind. Um, you know, we're coming through this time uh, when the, um, the uh, colonies are breaking away from England and uh, starting this revolution. Jefferson, of course, is uh, very involved in this. He wrote the Declaration of Independence. Uh, and uh, uh, the big question is, who are we anyway, right? Are we Englishmen? Um, you know, many of the people who were protesting against uh, the abuses, uh, the taxes uh, that were being levied, uh, they didn't like the taxes. Um, they didn't like the fact that they didn't have any representation in the English Parliament. But they certainly didn't think of themselves as something other than Englishmen. You know, we're Englishmen, right? And, you know, the idea that you would actually break away uh, from England and start a whole new country was the last thing in their mind, right? So what are these people doing when uh, Jefferson and Jay and his buddies uh, get together in Philadelphia and uh, write a Declaration of Independence, right? Well, you, I can tell you what they're doing. Uh, they're beating a path to uh, 
uh, the areas where the British are still in control, right? They're going off to Canada um, and they're uh, uh, taking their stuff with them, right? Now that last phrase is important, right? Because taking their stuff with them is something that you can do if you are a manufacturer or a trader. Um, you can, if you're making rum in Boston, a lot of people in the upper Massachusetts area were you know, buying sugar which was produced in the Caribbean and hauled up there making rum. You know, you don't like doing this because you've got an investment in your factory and so on, but you can take it down and move it to Montreal, right? Um, it's, and, and when things get tough, uh, that's exactly what you're going to do. But Jefferson understood that the people that stuck around and that fought the war and that saw themselves as having to be committed to building a country were the farmers. And the reason was that they couldn't take their stuff with them, right? Their stuff was the country, right? You know, we talk about living in the country, right, as this sort of idyllic, you call it thing, right? Living in the country means living in the, the political place that is the, the nation, right? And farmers are wedded to the country, those were, are Jefferson's words, in ways that no one else is, right? So that's why farmers are the most valuable citizens. They're tied to their country and wedded it to its liberty by the most lasting bonds. So Jefferson understood that when it comes to thinking about who your citizens are, who are the people that you can depend on are, who are the people that you can build a country on, it's not the guys that are making rum in Boston. It's not the guys that are building ships, because they can take, sail those ships someplace else when things get tough, right? Um, you know, they can, they can vote themselves a lot of businesses and vote down the taxes that you need to pay for, it, right? Um, but uh, uh, the people that are going to have to stick around and make things work uh, are the farmers. So we can illustrate this again with another story, uh, uh, with another founding father, uh, Alexander Hamilton, right? Hamilton's a revolutionary just like George, uh, Jefferson, um, and, uh, you know, very committed to the country. Uh, but uh, after the, the country gets up to be kind of a going concern, uh, Hamilton and Jefferson are both members of uh, George Washington's uh, cabinet. Uh, and uh, they actually have a very bitter dispute. Uh, you know, this, the country's young, doesn't have a lot of money, um, has managed to borrow some money, especially from the Dutch. The Dutch were very <coughs> interested in financing uh, the U.S. So we got a little bit of of capital to work with, and we can collect some taxes, right? But uh, uh, very limited in terms of what we can do. We, got, we know we've got to have an army, we've got to have a navy, right? That's what the, Jay was talking about. But what can we do to actually build the country, right? Uh, and uh, uh, Hamilton's idea was what we need to be doing is we need to be encouraging the development of textile factories in New Jersey. Uh, he looks at the most prosperous nation in the world at that time, which is the nation we've just fought a war with. And what are they doing? They're building textile mills like crazy. Their, their economic and industrial growth uh, is built around these factories. So um, it's a very, uh, it's actually a, a message that we hear all the time in Michigan. I don't know whether you hear this in Nebraska. It's jobs and it's high technology, right? That's what we need to be doing politically. Right? That's where we need to be focusing our energies politically. Uh, and uh, Jefferson's view is very different, right? And it's very different based on what we've just been talking about, right? We got this new country. It's very fragile. We need people who are going to be committed to it as citizens, right? Who are going to see their interests as tied to the future of this country and see themselves as wedded to it in a long-term way. So Jefferson is lobbying for... Uh, a very different strategy, which is that uh, instead of building textile mills in New Jersey and trying to follow the path uh, that was followed in England and in France, uh, we need to be focusing on developing a country around owner-operated farms uh, that are spread all across the continent. Now, Jefferson uh, was quite savvy. He uh, recognized that one of the problems in uh, England and France, and indeed throughout Europe, is that uh, there had been quite a bit of concentration of land ownership uh, I don't know if anybody in here is watching Downton Abbey, right? But, you know, if you're watching Downton Abbey, you're seeing that finally falling apart, um, you know, basically 120, 150 years after Jefferson, right? You know, they're having a hell of a time keeping the Downton Abbey farm going and, 
you know, that's not working right. But, you know, you've got a system where you've got very large landowners, you've got people who are basically farming on tenancy arrangements. Uh, that doesn't really kind of give you the kind of citizenship Jefferson's interested in. We've got to have these owner-operated farms, and we've got to have them all across the continent. That's what the future of the, the country's going to look like. Uh, so, to make a long story short, I mean, I've already made it long, so I'll make it short now. Um, uh, Alexander Hamilton gets killed in a duel with Aaron Burr, and Jefferson becomes president, right? So, that's how this gets decided, right? Uh, and uh, what does Jefferson do uh, when uh, he uh, uh, becomes president is the, the big thing, his, the big action of his administration was to execute the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, spends all the country's money on a bunch of worthless land. Uh, I noticed that there is this sort of curiously shaped stave right in the middle of that. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and, you know, kind of builds his idea that we're going to build a country around this idea that we are, will be uh, a nation of farmer citizens. Uh, and uh, I want to call this kind of philosophy that sees agriculture as special in this way an agrarian philosophy of agriculture. Now this word irritates some people and I keep using it maybe because I like to irritate people, but I don't know. I, I mean it speaks to the idea, it, 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 in the same way that the industrial philosophy doesn't necessarily mean big factory farms, uh, this doesn't necessarily mean kind of classic uh, agrarian you know, landlords sitting on estates or something like that. Um, but it's just the idea that agriculture has a special function and a special role to play, uh, and that it's going to define uh, a broad set of uh, uh, political ideals, uh, cultural ideals. It's going to, in some respects, tell the new country um, who they are, who they are. So let's fast forward ahead a little bit. Um, and another president who is actually not usually thought of uh, as uh, someone who is particularly focused on agriculture. Uh, but uh, while Lincoln was a candidate, uh, he gave a fairly famous uh, speech um, to the Wisconsin Agricultural Society, uh, and I'll read this quote from the speech. It's a, little bit, uh, uh, it, it's a little bit muted from what Jefferson said. So Lincoln says, I presume I am not expected to employ the time assigned me in the mere flattery of farmers as a class. My opinion of them is that, in proportion to numbers, they are neither better nor worse than any other class. And I believe there really are more attempts at flattering them than any other. The reason of which I cannot perceive, unless it be that they cast more votes than any other. On reflection, I am quite sure that there is not cause of suspicion against you in selecting me in some sort of politician, and in no sort of farmer, to address you but farmers being the most numerous class, it follows that their interest is the largest interest. It also follows that that interest is most worthy of all to be cherished and cultivated, that if there be inevitable conflict between that interest and any other, that other should yield. Now this speech, which is on the USD web website today, if you go on and read the rest of it, you actually learn that Lincoln's campaign platform didn't really have that much to do with uh, fighting a civil war or ending slavery. Um, you know, some of you who have seen the recent film know that he was actually kind of reluctant to do some of that. But he did have a campaign platform that was very focused on developing American agriculture. Uh, and he actually accomplished many of the things that he said he wanted to accomplish uh, in that speech in Wisconsin. So as when he became the 16th President of the United States, one of the things that Lincoln did was to create the U.S. Department of Agriculture, which he called the People's Department. This is the department that would speak for the people of the United States and would, would, uh, 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 would speak to their interests. Uh, Lincoln talks about uh, uh, creating programs of agricultural research. He doesn't use the phrase agricultural research. But he suggests that uh, we can do things that will actually benefit farmers, and by benefiting farmers, uh, as opposed to perhaps manufacturers or uh, uh, physicians or other classes in um, 1860s society, uh, we're actually going to be benefiting the country as a whole. Uh, he signed the Homestead Act, uh, which is uh, the, lack, the, the act that actually distributed a lot of the U.S. public lands uh, for homesteaders who would go out and uh, 
if you could uh, uh, develop your, your, your homestead uh, agriculturally, uh, then you would uh, 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 take title of that land. Uh, the Homestead Act uh, uh, lasted uh, from, uh, I've forgotten what the first year, 1862, 1863, on into, it actually didn't, uh, the last uh, year of the Homestead Act, I think, was uh, in the 1980s. Um, there were still homestead lands that you could still uh, get. He also signed the Morrill Act, uh, which created the system of land-grant universities uh, that had a focus on agricultural and mechanical arts. We could go back to Jefferson there, because if you go to uh, Monticello and see Jefferson's tombstone, uh, there are three things on the tombstone. None of, being president isn't one of them, but Jefferson thought he had three uh, uh, important accomplishments. One of them was writing the Virginia Statute on Religious Liberty, uh, which basically is, uh, you know, we should be tolerant of religious, religious diversity statute. One of them was writing the Declaration of Independence. Uh, and then the other was being the founder of the University of Virginia, which in Jefferson's view was going to be very much like a land-grant university. It was going to be a university uh, that would be focused on broad education and would teach uh, practical skills that would be useful to uh, all people. <coughs> Lincoln is the one who actually gets credit for accomplishing that. So let me ask for a second, what does all this have to do with sustainability? I mean, I want to suggest that actually, uh, uh, for both Jefferson and Lincoln, this was all about sustainability. For Jefferson in particular, this was what he was talking about. Is this new country going to be sustainable? And his concern was that if we build a country on a system of manufacturers, on new jobs and high technology, uh, we're taking a risk with the sustainability of our society. If we build a country on um, owner-operated farms, uh, we actually are uh, in a much better position uh, to have a sustainable society. So for Jefferson, the sustainability of the new American Republic depended on populating the land with people who understood themselves as citizens, right? Not just as businessmen, not just as people who needed a job, not just as people who needed a meal, but people who understood themselves as citizens. And in Jefferson's view, that depended on agriculture. For Lincoln, the economic and political sustainability depended on the viability and prosperity of these independent family farms uh, that had been the result of Jefferson's vision, something that's very broadly spread over the, pop over the populist and uh, populace, and of course in Lincoln's time, well after Lincoln's time, uh, is indeed the most numerous, uh, farmers are the most numerous uh, class in society. So. I want to suggest that for both Lincoln and Jefferson, um, they had a kind of agrarian philosophy of society. society uh, having a sustainable society meant creating a society that is robust, that's capable of resisting threats, whether those threats come from uh, uh, outside in the form of invading armies or from inside in terms of decay and uh, lack of political will that's also resilient, that's able to bounce back after disruptive, and that's adaptive, that's actually able to improve in responses to changes in its external environment. Um, and for both Lincoln and Jefferson, among all sectors of the American economy, agriculture had a special role to play in achieving each element of a sustainable society. I think it's quite reasonable to ask whether we can still say the same thing today. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, can we in some sense see uh, the possibility for uh, a kind of agrarian vision moving forward in our society? Um, I think that many of the things that are happening um, are, uh, in, are people in some sense reaching back to and feeling some animation of the way in which uh, agriculture was thought to be so fundamental uh, to uh, the fate of our society. Maybe that's nostalgia, but, or maybe there are ways in which we can actually think about our food system animating our lives uh, in ways that would give us a sense of who we are and where we're going. Um, but I think that uh, there is, in some sense, um, also uh, a, a deep conflict uh, that's emerged here between these two philosophies of agriculture, uh, that oftentimes farmers and many of us find ourselves in a tension here 
with respect to these philosophies of agriculture. So let me just illustrate a few possible ways in which this tension might show up. And uh, I don't mean any of these as definitive analyses of these policy issues. But if we take uh, water, right? Uh, traditionally, farms have had a very favored status with respect to both access to water and use of water uh, and uh, uh, not you know, necessarily been held to account in the same way that uh, you know, somebody who's operating a factory might be held to account in terms of uh, how they uh, dispose of their waste and so on and so forth. Uh, and I think that, again, uh, is part of the inheritance of uh, Lincoln and Jefferson's vision that agriculture has a special role to play. Uh, agriculture is bedrock, and you know we need to support farmers, right? We, we need to give them uh, some, some support. Uh, on the other hand, if you think that agriculture is just another sector of the industrial economy, then you know, farms are going to be treated the same way as any potential polluter, right? You know, just like you know, that factory down the street or that gas station, right? Or that hospital, right? You don't want that hospital, you know, they got radiation in there. You don't want them just dumping that stuff out in the back alley, right? Um, all forms of the, of, of the, all firms in the economy um, are potential polluters and, you know, agriculture is now seen as uh, really no different. Uh, and so, um, you know, from this idea that agriculture uh, had kind of a favored status, uh, we now actually start to see uh, agricultural firms, farms, right, uh, being treated as potential polluters. And if they're just a firm like a gas station, uh, then we have to be uh, concerned about the environmental risks that they're going to pose on us. If we take, uh, on the other hand, I mean, there are some ways in which we see farms as actually uh, being able to do very good things for us in terms of the environment, perhaps in ways uh, that uh, gas stations can't, right? I mean, you know, farms uh, uh, can uh, preserve uh, wildlife. They can, uh, the farm can actually, uh, farming can be done in a way that uh, improves water quality. Uh, you know, farms are, are uh, you know, can be uh, beautiful places. I realize that uh, we don't do this much in, in the United States, but in many parts of the world, People go for recreation on farms instead of going to parks. Um, so the idea that uh, uh, farms could be actually uh, a positive contributors to the uh, environment, um, you know, that's, that's a question that from a kind of an industrial perspective um, is really going to be a question that we just evaluate um, strictly in terms of, uh, you know, whether or not doing something good for the environment makes sense from an industrial perspective, right? Um, it, you, know, do, you know, what do the dollars look like? Does it really pay uh, to undertake these kinds of conservation things? Uh, and uh, if it does, you know, by all means, go do it, right? You know, I mean, I'm running a golf course. Um, I can uh, perhaps uh, design my golf course in a way that promotes, uh, uh, you know, bird life. And uh, if I can make more money off of my golf course and doing that, by all means, go ahead and do it. But if it's going to cost me revenue, then I probably shouldn't do it, right? From an industrial perspective, that's exactly how you should approach those questions. Uh, but on the other hand, um, if we think of agriculture uh, as having kind of special custodial role with respect to the environment, this probably wouldn't have occurred to Jefferson, right? Um, but if we think of agriculture precisely because it occupies so much of the land as having a special role to play, in terms of promoting environmental uh, values, it might actually be a new way of understanding why we would think of agriculture as special and as different from gas stations. Um, <clears throat> let's think a little bit about diet. Um, here's a food pyramid, and you may not like that one, so here's another food pyramid. <laughs> and if you don't like that one, here's yet another food pyramid. And uh, I can actually keep this up uh, for at, at some length. Um, um, those are not all the food pyramids that you can find on the uh, internet, but that's enough for today, right? What about this idea, the connections between uh, agriculture and the broader food system, the foods that people eat, right? Um, I think that if you're looking at this uh, from a kind of classic industrial perspective, uh, there are some marketing opportunities here, right? 
um, you know, if people start to buy into uh, the donut pyramid, right, that's great for people in the donut business. If they buy into, uh, this is, I think, the last one, I think, is the Mediterranean pyramid, right? So this is a good reason uh, to start growing uh, lots of uh, beans and, uh, uh, you know, good wheat for pasta, right? I mean, this will be part good for your business if you're a farmer, right? So you kind of look out there, and then you also recognize that, you know, as an industrial firm, you've got every right to promote whatever kind of vision of the, whatever pyramid you like, right? So, you know, you sort of pick whichever pyramid uh, matches up with whatever it is that you're growing, whatever your, your particular little part of the economy is, and you say, well, we're going to push that, right? We're going to advertise that. And that's what we expect from energy companies, and that's what we expect from uh, uh, Hollywood, and that's to some extent what we even expect from our healthcare industries. Uh, and um, I, I don't mean to be sarcastic. I mean, I think this is in fact what we expect firms in an industrial economy to do. Um, it is, however, uh, possible that thinking about the relationship between uh, farming as part of an integrated food system, food system could become a new way of why we might think farms are special. We might think that farms are special because food is special. We all have to eat food, uh, and uh, the food that we eat becomes part of our bodies, uh, and this might actually be a way that we could sort of rehabilitate a kind of agrarian way of thinking about agriculture that seems to become uh, harder and harder to think uh, in, in the era of, uh, when agriculture looks so different than it did uh, in uh, uh, in Jefferson's time and Lincoln's time. Uh, clearly this uh, probably winds up uh, imposing some new responsibilities on agriculture. So it's not a cost-free kind of thing, right? Um, but uh, if you get a certain amount of sense that uh, you're special, you may get some privileges, uh, but you may also have some additional responsibilities. So what about uh, biofuels, right? I think from an industrial perspective, um, you know, agriculture is a technology platform, right? Um, and it can be used to pr produce many different kinds of goods. It can be used to produce food, it can be used to produce fiber, um, and all industries look for new product lines, right? Um, back in the Stone Ages, Apple signed a memorandum of agreement with the Beatles, you know, because the Beatles, some of you, anybody here remember the Beatles? <laughs> so the Beatles used to have this company called Apple, right? And uh, when Apple computers got started, they signed a, a memorandum of agreement with, with the Beatles, the Beatles, that the Beatles wouldn't sue them for running a, capital, a company called Apple uh, if they agreed to stay out of the music business, right? Well, it turned out that Apple, I mean, 20, 10 years later, it turned out Apple was in the music business, right? You know, some of you may have heard of iTunes, right? Um, and uh, so there was this long protected lawsuit with the Beatles. Um, um, you know, my point being that, you know, if you're in an industry, you're always looking for new product lines, you've got a particular technology platform, you've got a way of producing stuff, uh, and uh, if you can move into something else, it makes perfectly good sense to do that. Eventually, the Beatles and Apple signed their agreement, and you can now buy Beatles tunes on iTunes, right? Um, <clears throat> alternatively, we might think that um, this food connection is important in ways that uh, uh, are, are challenged as you start to move into some of these new products. Uh, and that uh, uh, ties to local food systems really need to come first. Now this, you know, I'm in print, I will tell you that I'm in print defending biofuels, right? I'm not going to go run down that line with you today, but you know, I'll send you guys the articles if you want. I'm not here to trash biofuels, but um, you know, from an agrarian perspective, you might think that you know, ties to your local community really need to come first. And so, you know, it would only be when you were sure uh, that some of those connections had been maintained <coughs> that you would look to some of these other things. Um, and there's also this uh, thing that people are discovering right now, uh, that when your product is tied to uh, fuel, uh, you introduce a lot of volatility into your markets. And that might not be so good uh, for agriculture when it's thought of as this special uh, kind of sector of the economy. Let's take a look at uh, animal issues. Um, I think here uh, we are, we're seeing uh, the idea that uh, uh, you know profits, profit-seeking businesses, uh, you know, can 
cause exploitation. I mean, you know, part of the reason we have rule number two about not harming third parties uh, is that we know that firms that are seeking profits can actually do things that, uh, that, that cause harm to third parties. Uh, and what we're seeing throughout society uh, is uh, and, uh, the idea that, hey, these animals are third parties, right? And uh, so uh, if you're uh, a profit-seeking industry, uh, then we have to introduce regulations to protect the animals, just like we've introduced regulations uh, to protect the people. Um, you do see uh, a fair amount of uh, uh, people taking it on faith uh, that uh, smaller farmers uh, can be trusted, and maybe, maybe the, big, the problem is as you get up to this kind of scale. This is also an area where I've got a lot of stuff in print, and I'm not going to tell you all the stuff that I've talked about here. I'm just trying to give you a sense that um, there's some tension here between the way that these two uh, approaches look at that issue. And finally, this is an issue where I've done some work uh, recently. Um, uh, early applications of nanotechnologies in agriculture are likely going to focus on monitoring and food supply chains. Um, you, we will we'll very likely, I mean, in some respects, this is, we're already seeing this with the drones. I mean, the drones may not be using nanotechnology, <coughs> but they're using, what nanotechnology essentially does is it allows you to cross barriers between biology and information technology. Uh, so we'll start seeing more monitoring, uh, real-time monitoring of uh, crop data and animal health data. Uh, and, uh, you know, the question from an from a industrial perspective is, do these things really make reduce risk? Are they actually really helping us uh, promote whether it's animal health or public health? Uh, but we'll also be interested in whether or not they actually have any benefits for the producers, right? A lot of producers are using drones because they see these as uh, making good sense from a business perspective. This is how you uh, address questions about new technology uh, from an industrial perspective. Um, and I think the concern with monitoring technology, we certainly see this in Michigan. Maybe you don't see this in Nebraska, but we see this in Michigan with our, our, our dairy industry especially. Uh, and there's some concern that uh, the press towards more monitoring uh, is really going to tip the balance uh, against small producers. Um, it, it, it's going to put more power, uh, not so much in the hands of the large producers, but more power in the hands of uh, uh, the Walmarts of the world who are going to specify things about the supply chain uh, that uh, a nanotechnology is going to be able to tell them and that that's going to make things harder for small producers. Uh, and then there's also this thing that the word nanotechnology is really scary. Uh, and uh, so uh, it may be possible to actually uh, just uh, uh, frighten people with this technology. So I'm, I'm basically done here. I've talked a little longer than I intended to. Uh, I would say, you know, the, one of the primary pushes that we experience to regulate agriculture today, it derives from this industrial philosophy of agriculture. You may specify that philosophy in relatively more conservative terms or in more what we call liberal terms. You may have different views about the role of government. But, you know, you see agriculture as a firm in an industrial economy. Uh, and this is going to get you to uh, this idea that, uh, uh, you know, that's how we should think about agriculture. It's very commonplace for people who uh, do not play, do not work in the food economy. Um, it's kind of natural that you might think of agriculture as just another sector of the economy, but it's also a vision that is being pretty actively promoted by many farmers and farm organizations today. Um, and I want to suggest that uh, people both within and outside farming and agriculture are, are increasingly caught in the tensions between these two contending philosophies of agriculture. And they, they set up <coughs> incompatible expectations. They, they, on the one hand, we want to help farmers, we want to favor farmers. On the other hand, farmers are no different than anybody else, right? Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, both creates burdens for farmers, and it also uh, keeps them from realizing certain opportunities that they might have uh, if they're thought of as uh, special. So my suggestion here is that getting a handle on some of these tensions may be the first step, uh, and that's what I mean by a practical tool for helping us think and talk about how ideas shape the world in which we work and act. Thank you. Mm -hmm.